church is beautiful, your church is broken, but you are holding us together in your arms. At times we are shaken, but never forsaken. Jesus, you're making us more like who you are. Pure. Good morning. Thank you all so much for being here at Zion Lutheran Church of Wayside here this morning as we gather to hear God's word, as we gather to receive the gifts that God has given to us, and hear our young ones sing this morning. We are super, super excited to have all of you here with us, um, especially as we get closer and closer to the holiday season. Please be sure to take a bulletin. If you didn't get one, we have them available in the back and take them home with you. There are so many announcements, so many special events, so many ways to love our neighbor uh, through various means here at Zion Wayside, and they're all written down here. And always keep track of our Facebook page, Zion Lutheran Church of Wayside on Facebook. Our school also has a page as well. We're constantly putting updates on our Facebook, on our website, and you can be up to date, have your calendar updated through all of those means. Um, but especially, take home this bulletin and mark up your cal calendar. A few special announcements as we get started. First, I'd like to do this. We had an incredible Veterans Day service on Wednesday. Uh, a huge thank you to our principal, Mr. Gosa. Um, the uh, Reedsville Honor Guard was here. Uh, Mr. Wilbert Lupnow, 
uh, a member here spoke about his experience in the military, and I know we had many veterans who are members of our congregation join us for that service as well. Um, to celebrate Veterans Day this weekend, I'd, I'd like to ask, are there any veterans amongst the congregation today? And if there are, could you please stand? Can we give a big round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. We, we are so grateful for all that you've done to serve God and your country. And uh, we will include our veterans and then those currently active uh, who are members of our congregation. We will hold those names in our prayers today and always uh, as well. There are a few um, inserts that are available on tables in the Zion Cafe that I'd like you to take note of. First is this little handout. There's a salt shaker and light bulb at the top to symbolize our theme for our school year, to be salt and to be light. We have the opportunity to love our neighbor, and there is a family in our community that sends their children to our day school that are in need of help, uh, kind of just getting by day by day in terms of things like rent and groceries and utilities, things that we need on a daily basis. They are in need of our help. And we have a fund here that's called the Good Samaritan Fund. If you are interested in providing for that Good Samaritan Fund, which is there for moments like this, there for people who are in moments of need, there's a little QR code at the bottom of this sheet, and that gives directly to that Good Samaritan Fund. Otherwise, if you write a check in the memo line, you can write Good Samaritan Fund, or if you give via envelopes, just make sure you write very clearly on that envelope, Good Samaritan Fund. And again, we have been blessed to be a blessing to others, and this is an opportunity to be an incredible blessing uh, to this family. So thank you for all of your support in that way. We have been going through the building process, step by step here at Zion, for the potential of expanding our school. We had a meeting a few weeks ago, and now we have pamphlets that are available to anyone, again, in the Zion Cafe, on the tables out there, for you to take that explains that presentation. If you weren't able to make that meeting, this pamphlet will explain the process that we've gone through thus far and what our goals are. On the very back of this pamphlet, we love our QR codes. You can scan this code and it'll take you to an online survey. If you are a school family, I believe you already received that survey via email, but especially if you have not, we would love to get all of the input that we possibly could on that survey. If you're like me, and maybe not the most tech savvy, we also have paper copies of the survey that you can fill out anonymously and when you fill out that survey, this can be dropped off in the drop box just outside the door as you enter into the church offices. We would greatly appreciate all the feedback that we can get as we uh, close in on the uh, building process here at Zion Wayside. Really quickly, Wednesday is the deer hunter service. All of you deer hunters out there, and even if you're not, you're welcome to join us for worship at 7 o'clock at Mertz Garage. Food starts at 6. Again, everybody welcome to join us. Because we are there for Deer Hunter Service, no regular worship here on Wednesday night in the sanctuary. Uh, Thanksgiving times are out. Wednesday night and Thursday morning at 9.30. Advent schedule is out. And a whole lot more. Uh, including Operation Christmas Child and the Giving Tree. Again, please take this home uh, and uh, have all of the significant dates that you need to have. As we begin worship this morning, I invite the congregation to please stand for a word of opening prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for this great joy that we have to be gathered here together to hear the good news of Jesus. May you move your spirit in our hearts and in this place that we might give you all thanks, praise, honor, and glory for the gift of a Savior that you have given to us this day. 
And finally, go with us, that being moved by faith, we may continue to love you and love our neighbors as ourselves. We pray all of this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We join together in singing our opening song, You Are Holy. Today we're going to hear a lot about law and gospel. And one of the functions of the law is it serves as a mirror. Show of hands, how many of you looked at yourself in a mirror before you arrived today? Okay, I'm surprised by how many hands are not up. <laughs> right? But you looked at a mirror, most of you, this morning and probably thought to yourself, I look good. I'm ready. I'm ready to start the day. What happens when we read the law? 
What happens when we read the Ten Commandments and we hear about how God has called us to live? Maybe we don't have that same thought. Maybe we hear God's law about how not to steal and not to covet and how we're to speak well of everyone and think well and have the kindest thoughts and kindest words about all people. You see, the law serves as a mirror, but it shows us our sin. Please join me in a word of prayer as we bring our sin before God our Father. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we have heard your word and we have studied your word. You have written your word on all of our hearts. That is the word of your law. You have called us to live a certain way and love our neighbors as ourselves. Yet there are times where we are selfish. There are times where we go astray. We humble ourselves before you at this time and bring all of our sins before you, Heavenly Father, and pray that you hear our prayer of confession. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God has heard our prayer and speaks to us the gospel. Even as we see our sin, we hear good news. As the law shows us our sin, the gospel shows us Jesus. And we see the sacrifice that he has made on our behalf that now God sees us as clean. God sees us as innocent. And so I proclaim his words to you this morning. Your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. At this time, the congregation may be seated, and I'd like to invite forward our school children to share a special song with us, God is Great, I Am Unique.
For those of you who would like to stay up for the children's message, you are more than welcome to do so. Any young ones that we have in our congregation as well that would like to come on up for a children's message, we've got plenty of space. And we have a traffic jam. That's all right. Come on up. We've got a children's message this morning. And again, any young ones who are in the pews, please come on up and join us. Awesome. All right. Thank you all so much for being here. You guys sounded great, by the way. Really, really talented. And the song that you sang contained a word that maybe we don't hear every single day, maybe even a big word, and that word is unique. Can someone tell me, what does it mean to be unique? Yeah. No one else is like you. Yeah. Unique. You're special. You are yourself, and there are things about you that are true about no one else. They are special to you. Can anybody give me exam an example? What, what makes you unique? Yeah. Yeah, the color of your eyes, right? The color of your eyes. If someone were to scan your eye, some of them may look similar, but your eye is your eye. What else makes you unique? Yeah. Your hair, yeah. Guess what? Your hair is your hair. And while sometimes it may look familiar, or look similar, it is yours, you are unique, yeah. Your thumbprint, yeah. We have a lot of technology these days where sometimes you unlock something or open something by putting your finger to it. Your thumbprint, your fingerprint is yours, it's unique. One more, yeah. Your feet, yes, absolutely. Your feet make you unique and you put your feet and your socks and your shoes and they're yours, right? And your heart, absolutely, absolutely. All very, very good answers. Some of you may know that maybe when your mom and dad come up for communion and you come up with them, you might come to me or an elder and you get a blessing. If you come up and receive a blessing from me, you hear these words. You are a unique child of God, full of potential, and washed in the blood of Christ. You hear that every single Sunday, that you are unique, that God has made you to be you, and given you unique talents and abilities that you can help the people around you. And you are full of potential. Potential is a word that tells us that we are going to do great things. That we can use the gifts that God has given us to do incredible, awesome things. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, you are forgiven. Our sins have been washed away by Jesus dying on the cross because he loves us so dearly. So we can always remember that we are unique, we are God's child, we are full of potential, and our sins have been washed away. And these are all things that we can be thankful for, so let's give thanks to God. Please join me in praying. We'll fold our hands and bow our heads, and please repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for making me me. I am unique. I am your child. And I am forgiven. Thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, thank you guys for coming up. You can head back to your seats.
And as they head back to their seats, we continue our service with our readings. The epistle reading for today is from Romans chapter 7. What then shall we say, that the law is sin? By no means. Yet if had I not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. And our Gospel reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 5. And Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll remain standing as we join in singing our song of the day, Overcome.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. A couple questions for you to ponder as we get started here this morning. True or false? Being a Christian is defined by the special set of rules that we follow. True or false? Christians are not allowed to have any fun. True or false? Yeah, you guys answered that one, right? Yeah. True or false? Being a good person is what gets you into heaven. False. The reason I ask these three questions is because I can almost guarantee you you've heard someone mention at least one of them. I don't want to be a part of the church because all they do is they have to follow rules, and that's what the church is about. Is that the case? No, the church is infinitely greater than that. Christians aren't allowed to have any fun. What? You know, maybe we take offense at that one, right? We have a ton of fun here. How could it not be fun to live in the joys that Jesus has given to us? And lastly, you know, does being a good person get you to heaven? How do we respond to that one? Um, that's kind of kind of be the focus of our message here today because all of these statements come about when we confuse two truths that God has given to us and we hear them every single time that we gather here and those two truths are called law and gospel and today this morning in our last believe it or not our last clip for this season from The Chosen, Matthew is going to have some very interesting words to say about Jesus' words. So listen very closely to how Matthew describes the words that Jesus has spoken to him. Let's hit the lights and we'll roll the clip. Which section stands out to you the most? Do not be anxious about your life, of course. Are there any sections that concern you? Give me your honest opinion. I know I don't have to say that, but... It's all true. You know I won't be offended. It's... Oh... That is striking. But, if I do the math in terms of good news and bad, it seems like there's not a lot of good news. Anyone who looks at the woman with lust has already committed adultery. Doesn't that make everyone an adulterer? If the right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. What if that lead to an entire population of people walking around with only one eye? Oh, <laughs> and this one. If anyone were to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Trees that bear bad fruit being cut down and thrown into the fire. The gate is narrow and hard that leads to life. Depart from me, I never knew you. 
Do you realize how heavy laden your sermon is with these kind of ominous pronouncements? Yeah. I don't think it happened. It's a manifesto, Matthew. I'm not here to be sentimental and sweet. I'm here to start a revolution. Well, now your enemy is pray for those who persecute you. That isn't exactly... I said revolution, not revolt. I'm talking about a radical shift. Did you think I was just going to come here and say, Hey everyone, just uh, keep doing what you've been doing for the last thousand years since it's been going so great. You know, maybe we need to hear those words as well, right? So Matthew is reacting to the Sermon on the Mount in this scene. And the Sermon on the Mount is the greatest discourse, the longest discourse of Jesus that we have recorded in the scriptures. So a very, very significant moment in his ministry. And as he asks Matthew to recount, you know, what stood out to him, you know, they, they give Matthew some very interesting words to respond to Jesus, but included in his response, he used the word bad. There's more bad than good. And I single that word out because sometimes we use that word as well. But let me ask it to you this way. Does that make Jesus' sermon bad? Does that make Jesus' words bad? Yes, Jesus is pretty heavy on the law in this moment. But is the law bad? The law can be defined as, very simply, how things work. God created us to work a certain way, people. God created nature to work a certain way, and that way is good. However, as Jesus gets into the specifics, he begins to teach about anger and how we handle anger. He talks about our relationships. He talks about lust and divorce and things like that, how we handle relationships amongst each other. He talks about our words and how we make promises and the significance of the words that we speak. He talks about how we retaliate when someone does something harmful to you. All of these are very crucial things to teach his disciples. He is teaching his disciples how to be salt and how to be light. And for our our student body here today, we spent a lot of time talking about that this year, right? We are salt as we hold on to and preserve the way things work. That's the law. And we are salt by living according to that law. We are light by letting our light shine in the midst of darkness that is sin and evil. And we do that by loving our neighbors as ourselves. Here's a greater insight into how the law works and what it is that Jesus is teaching his disciples. What happens if something happens where, where it, it makes you angry? And here we have Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount and how we are to respond to being angry. You turn the other cheek, you give him the, the tunic, you kind of just forgive and not let the past interfere with the future. What happens if you ignore those words? What happens if you make a promise to someone and they are depending on you to fulfill that act, whatever it may be, that you have promised to do? Jesus tells us, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Your words have value. So what you speak, let it be true. If you make a promise, keep it. Right? What happens if you don't? If you are angry and you ignore the law that Jesus is speaking, that harms someone else. That harms your neighbor. Quite literally, physically, right? If you make a promise to someone and you don't keep it, they were depending on you, meaning they had a need, and they were dependent on you to fulfill that need. And guess what happened? You 
didn't. That, again, harms your neighbor. Why is the law necessary? Because the person sitting next to you right now needs you. And we can also reverse the script, right? What happens if you make a mistake and you made someone angry? That happens, right? What happens when they don't heed Jesus' words? You become worried. Sometimes people make a promise to you, and we can trust them. We're, tr we're trusting people. We trust them, and when that time comes, they haven't done it yet. They didn't keep their promise. How does that make you feel? We see how necessary the law is. The problem is the law points our focus outward, yet where are our thoughts? Our thoughts come right back to me. Jesus is speaking to a group of people that have been taught from the get-go to think about themselves. And so as he speaks rather strongly, know that he speaks strongly because he's working against the grain. He's working against our, uh, our sinful nature. It's almost instinctive for us to want to get revenge. Jesus speaks rather strongly because he's pushing up against that. But as we hear the scenarios of the law play out, we begin to understand, you know, maybe it's not the words on this page that are bad. Maybe it's not the words that God has given to us that are bad. In fact, we would agree that it's good to keep a promise. We would agree that it's good to not harm our neighbor when we get angry. We would agree that it's good to love our neighbor as ourselves. But when we read the words, what we see is, I'm bad. It's not the law. The law is good. The law is perfect. I just haven't kept it. I am a sinner. But even when we have that proper understanding, there is still good news, great news, the best news, and that is the gospel. As Jesus speaks these words of law, they only come after Jesus has already said, follow me, and extended his hand to them. These words of law only come after Jesus has given them the Beatitudes and said, blessed are you, you are an heir to the kingdom of God. All of these words that Jesus speaks about a law, even as he speaks very strongly, none of them have anything to do with these disciples earning and deserving their salvation. None of it. Because that's not what the law is for. The law is for your neighbor. The gospel is good news for the sinner. Because the gospel tells us there, that there is one who came to fulfill the law. Meaning, he did keep it perfectly. Jesus came to fulfill the law. That he might be made the sacrificial lamb of God. That having fulfilled the way that his father had set before him, he would die. He would suffer. He would be crucified to serve as a sacrifice that the sins of the world would be forgiven. That we may read the law and say, ugh, I haven't done so well. Yet, no! No! God has heard our word of confession. He would see the sacrifice that Jesus made and see that our sins have been washed away, that we have been made white as snow, pure, innocent, not guilty because of the love that Jesus has for us. More than that, not only are our sins forgiven, not only have we not received the punishment that we do deserve for breaking the law, he gives us, gives us as a gift, everlasting life. Good news. 
great news, the best news ever. God has poured out his spirit upon us that our eyes may be opened to the way that he created us, why he created us. He created us for each other. And as we go about living in this sinful, broken world, we don't have to look too far to see people who are in need. Here we are. Extend that helping hand. That's what we're called to do. That we may be salt and we may be light in shining the light of Jesus to the world around us. And even when we make mistakes, even when the world makes mistakes, we know and can now go forth and proclaim the good news that all of our sins have been forgiven in the name of Jesus. He died for our sake and now lives for our sake, giving us the gift of everlasting life in his name. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, I invite the congregation to please stand and we join together in confessing the one true faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light. Very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men, for our salvation, came down from heaven. Now let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the gift of faith that you have given to us that we may see Jesus and the good news that you have shared to the world through him. Truly, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And by his death and resurrection, you have given us the gift of everlasting life. Now... Walk with us that we may see how we are fearfully and wonderfully made to love our neighbor, to see a world of people that is in need, and just as you did, be willing to serve for their own sake. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks, especially this weekend, but always, for a special group of people that have made that sacrifice to notice that there is a world in need and serve you and this country for our sake. We give you thanks for our veterans and all that they have done for us. We lift up before you those who are members of this congregation that are currently serving, including Derek Rosenbaum, Gavin Grayler, Jacob Welty, Jordan Melesva, Alex Dreheim, and Caitlin Fells. Continue to watch over all of them, Heavenly Father, and protect them and guide them as they continue to live out the vocation that they have been called to. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask you to be over seeds of hope and the work that they do in Nigeria. Um, we are so blessed to live here in a place where we can gather like this safely um, and in peace. We know in that land that's not so easily done. Uh, be with Bomshek and his family and all of those who work in Nigeria, that they may continue to safely proclaim the gospel 
uh, to a land that needs to hear it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, watch over our church and our school as we continue to work through the call process and the building process as well and all of the things that we have going on, and that is a lot. May we all reflect you and your word. May we continue to stand firm in the truth of Jesus in all that we do, that, continuing to love you, we may be help to our community as well. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks, Heavenly Father, for Elliot and Emma Claire Piepenberg as we celebrated their wedding this weekend. Uh, continue to bless them and their lives together now as husband and wife, that in all things, their relationship may reflect your relationship with the church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, be with all of those in our hearts and in our minds who are going through difficult times, uh, times of physical pain, times of emotional distress, uh, spiritual needs. Heavenly Father, we pray that you, are lay, that you lay your healing hand upon all of those in our midst um, and grant peace and comfort in all situations. We pray on behalf of Gail Bartelt, Bob Disher, Amanda Rossner, Jarrett Troy, Jeff Lupnow, Charmaine Rimple, Willow Van Vondren, John Kiley, Darlene Gauger, Dave Timus, Jeanette Lepnow, Joyce Perizek, Bernice Griepentrog, Donna Etling, Octavia and Oakland, Erna Wolt, Steve Zerbel, Elmer Otto, Wally Francis, Marvin Lepnow, Bev Koshian, Char Lepnow, and Heather Brandt. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, Heavenly Father, watch over all of us this morning who... Prepare our hearts and minds to receive uh, the gift of the sacrament. May we do so in a worthy manner, having confessed our sins before you and humbling ourselves, yet taking your word as true, knowing that your word is truth. This is Jesus' body. This is Jesus' blood, given and shed for us for the forgiveness of all of our sins. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this good and gracious gift. Lord, in your mercy hear our prayer. And now, Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray together. Our Father, Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And now may the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. At this time, the congregation may be seated. And if you are a guest here with us today, if you are a member of the Lutheran Church, you are welcome to join us here at the altar. If you are a member of a different faith, we have these three questions uh, that we would like you to answer faithfully and truthfully uh, in order to come up with us, and that is, we confess our sins before God as we approach this altar, uh, humbling ourselves before Him, being honest about who we are as sinners. When we approach the altar, we take Jesus at His word. This is not a symbol. This is not a representation. Jesus spoke and said, this is my body, this is my blood. And Jesus' words are true. Finally, Jesus is addressing the problem. The problem of sin is addressed in his body and blood, and our sins are forgiven. Therefore, we go to continue to lead a life of loving God and loving our neighbor as ourselves. If you can faithfully confess these three things to be true, you are welcome to join us up at the altar. If you are a member of a different faith and would like to come up and receive a blessing,
please come up and indicate that you would like to receive a blessing by crossing your arms, and you are more than welcome to do that as well. At this time, we continue our service by celebrating the Lord's Supper.
Now may this, the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you unto life everlasting. You may depart in peace and joy. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. And now receive with believing hearts the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. 
The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. By God's grace, we are equipping generations for life in Christ. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll remain standing as we join in singing our closing song, The Greatness of Our God. with us this morning. God's blessings on your week.